Welcome to the best of series on Wesley Impact. As we wrapped up recording for 2014, we had many favourite shows that viewers wanted us to share again. Today we highlight our guest, John Brogdon, a man who talked to me about the challenge of overcoming extreme anxiety and depression, and later to become chair of Lifeline Australia. I hope you enjoy his story of breakthrough and faith. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Keith. Look, John, it's good to have you here. I just want to turn the clock back. You're just 36, and the doctor says to you, John, you will get better. Take us back to that time. Well, it was about two days after I'd resigned as Leader of the Opposition in New South Wales, and uh, from uh, as early as I can remember, I always wanted to be the Premier of New South Wales. I hope to think, Keith, that I was restlessly ambitious, not ruthlessly ambitious, but it had always been my ambition. I went into Parliament, 27, became a Shadow Minister at 30 and became Leader of the Opposition at 33. And three and a bit years after that, things fell in a heap for me. I made some mistakes, did some stupid things in public. It all became front page newspaper stories. And I decided that I should resign my role as Leader of the Opposition. However, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that in the next few days things would get worse. So within two days, within a day of, of resigning as Opposition Leader, things got so bad for me that I thought not simply the only thing to do, but the best thing to do was to take my own life. So. That conversation you referred to with the doctor happened about two days after that, and he said to me, John, things will get better. We were sitting in the suicide prevention ward of a mental uh, health facility in Sydney. Uh, I was bandaged from my injuries, my self-harm, my attempt to take my own life, and I was medicated. And <clears throat> locked away in this room with a doctor who I still see today, a wonderful man, when he turned to me and said, John, things will get better, I actually thought he was teasing me. How could, how could anything possibly get better? I was at the lowest point possible. How could things get better? So they did start to get better? They did. They did. And I had great doctors. I had great nurses. Uh, I had, a, have, had and have the same wife, a beautiful wife, incredible friends and family. Um, and one of the things I remember doing, Keith, is... Uh, a very good friend of mine works at a Catholic school and I asked him to organise for one of the priests to come up and uh, give me communion. And that was really important to me, to, to have that, have at that time uh, the opportunity to connect with Christ. Mm. And that was very important to me then. But over about the next eight to ten months, I got physically and mentally better. Uh, and I was able to get back going to see people and eventually find a job and, and enter the business world. Look, when you hold it together, it's hard to imagine that somebody could want to feel like that. Because like you say, you have all that backup at Lucy and family, all, all fine support. Yes. But you still somehow, it's almost as if it's put into a, a box all on its own over here, this part of your life, isn't yeah. it? Say, I'll end it. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, I often say, I mean, years ago, people would judge suicide as an act of cowardice or in fact, an act, act of selfishness. I always say never use a rational judgment. You never use a rational mind to judge the most irrational of all acts. Yeah. I mean, you know, in everything I've done in my life, in, in my character and my profile for people who've known me, they would never have thought I would get to that point in my life. I would never have thought that I would get to that point in my life. And it's the other demonstration with so much of what you see at Wesley, of course, Keith, the people who walk through your door and the people that you serve and, and give love to and care to. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, smart or, or, or not smart, black or white, none of that's relevant when you get to when mental illness takes control. In a sentence or two, if you're giving advice to somebody who is feeling like that, what would you say? I'd tell them that there is a way through and I'd tell them, I'd tell them that people love them, that, that people want to help. And, and people do want to help. People do want to help people through that point in their life. There, there is a way through the other end. Part of the message is it might get worse, but it will get better. It will eventually get better. There is a way through this. John, in a sense, you've gone full circle now because you're involved at the other end now, really advocating for people who are involved in the realm of suicide prevention. Keith, a lot of people leave public life and hang up their megaphone and move on. For me, I was given great opportunities as a young person to go into parliament, to lead a major political party. I had advocacy skills. I had a public profile. And I looked at one organisation in Australia that does unbelievably 
beneficial work for people in crisis, and that's Lifeline, started, of course, by one of your predecessors, Sir Alan Walker, back in 1963. And Lifeline's a magnificent organisation, and it's rarely that you can say that you're the chairman of an organisation that saves lives every day, and I have that great privilege. John, we'll come back to that and pick up that, that theme there. But before we go any further, I'm going to introduce you to our singer on today's show. Tim Moxie performed on the talent show The Voice last year. He's chosen to sing a song that reflects John's journey in a way. It's called Still With Me. In the quiet of my heart, I hear the silent scream. So Keith Garner's new book, A Word for the World, is now available. Dealing with the four themes of success, sorrow, society and spirituality, the 16 sermons in this book will definitely inspire and challenge you as you read. The book also includes a DVD featuring interviews with Nick Farr-Jones, Lee Hatcher, Tanya Plibersek and Margaret Somerville. For more information on A Word for the World, please contact us on 9263 5555 or at impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. So if you'd like to know more about Tim and his album called Stag Stargazing, the details are going to be on our Wesley Mission website all this week. Now, I'm back with uh, Lifeline Australia's chairman, John Brogdon. John, on Lifeline Australia took a record, I think it's 540,000 telephone calls uh, in 2012. And, and you could take many more? Well, Keith, in 2013, we went up to 680,000 calls. So Great. in one year, we increased the calls we answered by an extraordinary 25%, but we got 820,000 calls. So there's still about 
150,000 calls we don't get to. We're forecasting to get about 700, answer 720,000 calls in 2014. So no matter what changes in life, the vision of Alan Walker and the need for people in crisis and at risk of suicide to have a lifeline, a voice at the other end of the phone, grows and grows every year. We all have a, a role to play as a community and some of these things that we're talking about in terms of, of uh, suicide need to be raised, don't they, in the public space? Look, they do. Australia has come an incredible way in the last 10 and 15 years in coming to terms with and, if you like, accepting the realities in particular of depression and anxiety. However, suicide remains a difficult issue. We don't want to glorify suicide. The last thing we want to do, about 2,500 Australians take their own lives many, many thousands more attempt to take their own lives. Over the last 15 years or so, that figure's remained pretty stubbornly the same. We haven't seen a reduction in the number of suicides in Australia. But we have to talk about it. We can't stop, we can't whisper about it in the dark corners of a room. We need to bring it out and to make it real. And in doing that, we also need to ensure that people know there's help for them when they get, people get to that point. I know because we, we obviously do some of the same things you do. We yes. try to draw people's attention to this. And we often use the, the figure about the number of people who die in, in road accidents, though this year that's gone up and it, it is a big... But also as many as skin cancer and many of the other things. Sure. That... I mean, you look at all the, might I say, very important and very justified efforts that governments put into getting people to slow down on the road, mm. advertising and the like, campaigns, quite brutal campaigns to get people to slow down and drive safely. I'd like to see a day where we spend as much of that money promoting the services that are there for people who are in crisis. I mean, the, the vision for Lifeline is a bold vision, Keith. It's for an Australia free of suicide. And some may think you'll never get there, but unless we aim for that objective, we'll never even begin to reduce the number of people who take their own life. Who is at risk? Well, everyone, I guess, to be brutally honest, everyone. Uh, interestingly, the, in recent years, the increase not the largest number, but the increase in the number of people ta taking their own lives has been in men over 65. Men who leave their full-time job and don't know what to do with themselves. They've invested so much of their own character in the job that they have. They've gone one day from the, making multi-million dollar decisions to the next day trying to work out what time they have a coffee down the road. So that's been a group that's increased. But it's anyone uh, under incredible stress and crisis and, of course, people with mental illness. I'm thinking of your own story and I'm thinking of what you've just said. Are we too tied up with who we are and, and, and what we do every day to earn money that sometimes we lose the real purpose? I was too tied up in myself. I was uh, too... I don't know if I was too ambitious, but I was certainly too narrow in my focus in life. I'd, I'd, let, I'd let my job t take control of my life. I'd let my career take control of my day-to-day -day life. My wife, Lucy, will tell you she sat there in a, in a quiet panic watching me get more and more manic almost as time went on and more and more focused and less in control. So, look, we do have to keep a balance in our life and we have to be reasonably self-aware as well. We need to know what we need to do to keep that balance in our life. And faith can be very much a, a part of that, can't it? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, what's that great saying? There are no, no, uh, no atheists in foxholes. I mean, you know, we shouldn't wait. I'm an example of somebody who probably let, let myself get disconnected a bit from my faith in the run-up, or not, not, not my faith, not my religion, my connection with Christ, in the run-up to that event taking place. And now, with uh, while well, we had one child, then we have three children, you know, we, we do engage much more in the importance of, of Christ in our life. John, you're a good friend, uh, and it's good to have you on the show. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Keith. We're going to be back in just a moment. It's been 200 years since the first Methodists met in Australia. To celebrate two centuries of faith and pioneering care, CEO and presenter Reverend Dr Keith Garner takes us back to where it all began. But we don't begin here at the heart of London. We begin in a town in the north of England. In this fascinating narrative, Reverend Garner chronicles the history of the life and times of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. This fresh and thought-provoking documentary takes us on a journey throughout the United Kingdom, beginning in John Wesley's hometown of Epworth. John Wesley was born here on the 17th of June, 1703. This one-hour DVD travels on to his education years and beginnings of social justice in Oxford, to his final years in London. For more information on John Wesley, the man and his mission, call 02 9263 or email us at impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. 
Wesley Mission has been a leader in suicide prevention field for many years, from establishing the Lifeline movement in 1963 to developing our work through Wesley Life Force in the areas of prevention, intervention and postvention. Janine is someone who leads Wesley Life Force Network in Sydney's West. This is her story. Do you remember someone who has died all too soon? Sometimes it comes as a result of an accident. Sometimes people are taken from us by sickness and disease. For the Schramm family, their 31-year-old son Nathan became another tragic statistic of the greatest cause of death of his generation. We really didn't have any ideas that Nathan wasn't well. Um, the first sign that we got was um, a phone call. He just rang me this one day and said, Mum, I'm, I'm coming home. My marriage is over. Nathan got married the year that Janine and I met. As a person, Nathan, soulful, um, very compassionate, very caring. Yeah. He um, loved life. He came down from Mackay, stayed with us for close on three weeks. And because he'd been around family all this time, he just sort of said to me, Mum, I need to get away. I need to have some time to myself. And, and I think if I look back now, I knew. I just knew. And I just was powerless to, to do anything about it. Um, he took the car and, um, you know, I can remember him walking down those, those front steps here and opening up those gates for him and it was the last time I ever saw him. His letter to me stated, Mum, you know, um, this is not your fault. Um, you know, I've, I'd planned this a long time ago. We invest millions to curb the road toll. We invest millions in advertising to encourage people to protect themselves from the ravages of the Australian sun. But how do you prevent suicide? At Wesley Mission, suicide prevention strategies began in the 1960s with the development of Lifeline after a desperate call for help. Since 1995, our operations have moved into a new era with Wesley Life Force through suicide prevention training nationwide. I don't know where I'd be today if it wasn't for Wesley Life Force. It was only a couple of weeks after Nathan's death that I read an article in the local newspaper about a young funeral director, Janine Beetson. Um, and she was just alarmed at the amount of suicide deaths that were coming through her doors. And she put together a, um, an awareness, suicide awareness forum, forum in Penrith and um, Vern and I, my husband and I, went along to that, uh, that first night. And that's where it all started. Wesley Mission was there. I think it was probably within a few months we had a network put together. So I'm now very proud to be part of a network that that is doing some absolutely amazing stuff as far as suicide prevention goes. Our focus this year, we're looking at schools. It's all about mental health and you know all sorts of issues that young teenagers might be going through, how they'd react to that circumstance. Today, Wesley Life Force oversees 27 community suicide prevention networks throughout our capital cities and rural and regional Australia. One saved life is wonderful, you know, and that makes all the difference. Every life is worth saving. As we continue my series in First Peter, I remind you that he's writing to Christian people who are either suffering already or about to suffer for their faith. Peter makes a very close link between the sufferings of the early Christian churches and the actual sufferings of Jesus Christ. Peter, if you like, contrasts different kinds of suffering, the suffering that is deserved with suffering that is certainly undeserved. And you can see how he would clearly relate this to the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes the model of all unjust suffering. There are endless stories throughout the history of the world of people who found inspiration and hope through thinking deeply about the sufferings of Jesus. You know, it's kept some people close to God when almost everything else would have destroyed them. The example of Jesus offers to us a pattern of how we can handle unjust suffering in our life. So once again, I'm reading from 1 Peter, this time from chapter 2, verses 19 through to 24. 
For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To you, you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Just a few things that I want to commend to you. First of all, it is commendable to bear under unjust suffering because you're conscious of God. That's the context. That's what draws you to that place. And the commendation comes not because you're great, but because it brings you into that near place with God. The commendation is from God. This is commendable before God. So in other words, it's not really just, hey, we've done this and we're suffering in this particular way. Aren't we good? But this is recognized by God. So it sits outside of ourselves. It might even be observed by others as something that is entirely uncommendable, but it is commendable before God. Now, much suffering comes as a direct result of our following Christ. We read in verse 21, because Christ suffered for you. So when people find inspiration in, in looking at Christ's sufferings, they're not just um, looking at him as an example. They recognize that these sufferings are related to us. What happened on the cross was something that is directly related to ourselves. When our lives can get in a real mess, we heard earlier in the show of someone whose life almost uh, came to an end by their own decision. Life can become so very, very difficult but his suffering is for us. And the suffering servant becomes our pattern. He committed no sin. That's in verse 22. He committed no sin. None of us are like that. None of us can say we've done nothing wrong. There is nothing in our actions, not only in the deeds that we do, but in the condition of our lives. None of us can say that we have not sinned, but there was just one who committed no sin. And of all the people in the world to suffer, he was the last one who ever deserved it. And so it is that we see in him the, that sense of what is uh, not just being exercised against him in a way that is so hard to understand apart from love. And, and finally in that section, this brings healing and redemption, that redeeming, that, that sense of beginning all over again by his stripes or wounds, as it says in many Bibles, you have been healed. By what has happened to him, he offers a healing stream to all our lives so that we can know his forgiveness, his grace, his purpose, and life can begin again. We mustn't view suffering itself as something that is intrinsically good but see it always if we're going to see it in a redemptive way in the light of Christ. There's no credit in suffering for the wrong reasons. We don't want to become victims and say, here, this is what's happened to me. Is this is something that's really uh, to my credit and good? No, not if it's something that's for wrong reasons. But when we observe Jesus, we see one who suffered and eventually died for us, for all the right reasons, to put us right with the Father, to know what it is to offer forgiveness and grace. And in a real sense, our footsteps must be firmly planted in his. If you would like to know more about today's topic or for more on Keith's message, contact Keith by writing to Wesley Mission, Post Office Box A5555, Sydney South 1235 or email impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. Thanks for watching. Today's show really brings into sharp context just what it means to overcome depression and anxiety and what that can mean in our lives. We leave you with Jordan Warner singing, I have a plan for you. Goodbye and God bless. I watched an orphan boy fall to the ground Hiding his tears in his hand the weight of nobody returning for him Too much to understand 
Questions of why I circle round in my head Doubt starts to deepen in me But you've made a promise that you have a plan And I need to trust and believe When you say you have a purpose for all You've made that you see us Your heart it beats for you say that I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. You were chosen in love before you even knew that I have a plan for you. Oh, a beautiful plan. Sometimes the weight of the world closes in And sometimes it's hard to believe That no circumstance, present, future